Um, the cockpit's not answering. Somebody's stabbed in business class. I think we're getting hijacked. What's going on, Betty? Betty, talk to me. Betty, are you there? Betty? I think we might have lost her. Air France 004, I do not have time to chat right now. Break. We had to get control of the airspace. We had to get control of the sky. American 49, you are directed to land in Gander. American 49, you do not understand me. You will not. Is it on every airline? Is it only on a couple? Is it only in the US? You have been instructed to land. You will be landing in Gander. Now get your plane in line. No, U.S. airspace is close to all traffic at this time. Our only options are Gander and St. John. U.S. 49, you are directed to land in Gander. Listen, U.S. 49, you do not understand me. U.S. airspace is closed. Beef Delta 37, you will not be going to Cincinnati today. Break. U.S. airspace has been closed. My name is Dwayne Puddister. I live in Gander's Newfoundland. It was just a regular day. I got up around 8.30. I think I drove by one of the local establishments there to uh, pick up coffee and uh, probably a breakfast sandwich and just took my time, came into work. At that hour in the morning, it's, it's very slow. So the guy that was sitting at the sector that I ended up in, uh, he was working the whole airspace by himself. OK. She's on mine, Bill. Hey. I get in, relieve him. There's nothing going on. You got a few airplanes, but nothing much is happening. I got this. However, all the traffic was on its way across the ocean from Europe to North America. We know they're coming. Gander Center. My name is Harold O'Reilly. And I was the shift manager on duty during uh, September 11th, 2001. I reported for work. It was a very normal day. Well, it was my 50th birthday, yes. Uh, the only thought I had when I went to work that morning was, oh, no, what am I going to have to put up with this evening when I come home? Because usually on a 50th birthday, they always have a party or something, you know, with banners stuck up on the street. And uh, as it turned out, that was the least of my worries that day. <laughs> American 96945, affirmative, copy that. It was a quiet morning, routine morning. Um, normally in the arrival sector where I work, we would have two, maybe three people seated at that time of the day before all hell broke loose. Dramatic pictures of an accident that has happened just a short time ago. You're looking at the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan where just a few minutes ago, we're told that a plane, some reports are that it was a small commuter plane, crashed into the upper floors of one of the Twin Towers. I was just sitting in the office. One of the controllers came in. Harold. What's going on? You won't believe this. Come and see this. So we go out to the TV room. And I'm watching a replay of the first aircraft. And as I'm watching it, oh my god. It's not a small plane. It's not a small plane. It's a small plane. And when we saw the second aircraft, 
How could that happen? I think uh, like everybody in the room said, this is not an accident. What are you doing here? Now, the guy that I relieved, he came back in the building, in the in the ACC, and it was sort of like, kind of odd, really. And he had a strange look on his face. It's on TV. A plane just flew into the side of the Twin Towers in New York. Small aircraft? Mm. They they don't know. And he was talking about the airplane hitting the building in uh, in New York. It's going to be a big mess in New York City today. He was pale, and you could tell that he was in shock. He looked like he was in shock. Like he just couldn't believe that this was happening. We all sort of looked at one another and said, oh, my. If these are missiles, we have four or 500 coming. Canary Airport was uh, originally a, a refueling stop and an overnight stop. In particular during the Second World War, it was very important in the, to allow aircraft to get from North America to the European continent. The airport itself is very large. At one time, we had a runway on the airport that was uh, 1,000 feet wide. The normal runway today is 200 feet wide. And at the time, we had a runway that was 10,500 feet long. And Gander, at one point, was actually an alternate landing site for the space shuttle. Gander ATC instructs you to turn. Gander Air Traffic Center controls a huge chunk of airspace. Halfway across the oceanic to 30 degrees west longitude. British Airways 1503. And uh, the flights coming out of Europe, they all converge over Newfoundland. <laughs> We're like the narrow end of a funnel. So most of these aircraft that we're talking about are wide-body jets uh, carrying numerous passengers, 200 plus. And we are the first to receive them and the radar identify them and send them on their way to their different destinations. Six, you are identified. Say you requested flight level. The altitude restriction here is 29,000 feet and above, and that's where all these aircraft transition en route back and forth to North America. September 11th, 2001 was my first assigned shift as the National Operations Manager. The next event that occurred was the report of American 77 striking the Pentagon. We're looking at live pictures of the Pentagon where there is billowing smoke. Mick, Jim Miklaszewski just reported that he heard an explosion. I think people uh, here in the building are already describing as a highly sophisticated coordinated attack. And at that point, I felt there's nothing else to do but to land everyone. We had to get control of the airspace. We had to get control of the sky. As far as we know, there could have been 100 aircraft uh, like this. And, I, and all I could think of was, we have all these missiles out there that we have no control over whatsoever. My staff and I discussed uh, endlessly whether or not the military would shoot down American flag carrier uh, carrying American passengers on American soil. I did not think it was possible. Vice President Cheney did give an order to engage uh, aircraft after the last hijacked aircraft on 9-11 had crashed. We don't know who's on those planes. It is chaos. It is, this has never happened. This has never been planned for. There was no training for the controllers prior to this ever to anticipate this happening. There's no room for error. We make a mistake, bad things happen. I went back to the office because I figured that there's something going on. And I was not there very long when I got the phone call. Gander Control. 
from the New York FAA supervisor and told me that American airspace is closed. Uh, you can almost feel a chill go through you. What do you mean American airspace is closed? After reiterating it two or three times, finally I had to accept that it wasn't New York airspace, it was the complete American airspace was closed. Get those Harold had got the word that the U.S. airspace had been closed. And he told us about it, myself and the high-level supervisor and the oceanic supervisor. And they again looked at me as if I had two heads, and they said, that can't be. You can't do that. That's, that's, that's impossible. It's closed, OK? He had to convince us a bit. We said, this, this is some kind of joke or what? And no, no, it's happening. It's real. And all the airplanes that were inbound off the oceanic had to land at the nearest airports. Get ready. Done, let's uh, get it done. Dwayne does up top and All right, I so take it down. Get All of a sudden, it's like you, got, you have this enormous task right on your doorstep. You have to cope with it. You can't turn around and go home. So we said, OK, guys, let's get to work. When Harold walked down and looked at me. And it looked like he was still formulating the plan in his head. He was like, I can't believe I got to do this sort of thing. And then he tells me. You got to land these guys. <laughs> you, you think we're going to land all these guys? These aircraft have to be landed immediately. Bring them here. What if you can't fit here? Stephenville, Moncton, St. John's. Just keep them away from the big cities. OK, I'm going to land these guys. Potential that any aircraft in the air at that point in time could, in fact, be uh, be the subject of a, a terrorist attack, and that air traffic control were bringing aircraft into the community, knowing that there was a threat of uh, terrorism on these aircraft. That was certainly a concern. We're a very small population, and you don't point the aircraft towards heavily congested, heavily populated areas. You you, you send them to places where there's, if there if the worst possible thing happened. At least the damage is, uh, is minimized. That probably doesn't provide much comfort to, uh, to the people who live here to understand that, but I mean, that's a reality that, uh, that does exist. We were setting up arrival profiles in Scander, St. John's, Stephenville, Halifax, and Moncton. There was no favorite airline going anywhere. It was just whatever the logistics worked out to the best advantage of everybody. Now, I was the person who was the first voice contact with the aircraft in domestic airspace, and I had to deliver that message to each and every one of them. So how am I going to explain this to these guys, and are they going to believe me? Are they going to think that I've lost my mind? It was pretty, it was pretty scary. We were just about halfway across the Atlantic when I was handed a little ACARS message that comes across via satellite. We can print out messages from the company. And they had sent us a, a message, um, which I've saved in, in my documentation of the flight. Message from Chicago Dispatch. Two planes have hit the Trade Center in New York City. This is hijacking. Others may be in progress. That simple. Once we realized that there were airplanes involved in a violent act, then you had to make some assumptions. How extensive is this? How safe is my airplane? Tom, grab the crash axe. Take whatever 
means you deem necessary, and I'll explain it later. No one is coming through that door. Anyone does, you use it, understood? Understood. Nobody is going to get past you. Natasha? Pilots weren't carrying weapons at that time. So I thought, let's do what we can do. Let's use the resources we have on the airplane to take care of ourselves. We might have even talked about using a fire extinguisher if we had to, squirt somebody in the face, whatever had to be done, whatever it took. The pilot came on the intercom, and uh, in a very calm but uh, serious voice, he said, folks, uh, there's nothing wrong with this aircraft. He says, however, uh, he says that there's been an incident in the United States, and the borders to the, to the United States are closed, and we're going to Gander, Newfoundland. My range of imagination was uh, from A to Z. I knew this was uh, very, this was very, very serious. Air France 004, you will not be entering U.S. airspace today. Northwest 61, I'm not obliged to tell you anything. Right, you do not understand me. You have been instructed to land. Delta 37, you will not be going to Cincinnati. Due to an event in the USA, you will not be entering U.S. airspace today. You will be landing in Gander. Gander, Delta 37. We can't get through to our company. We need to stay on our flight plan route. You don't understand. You have been directed to land. Cleared present position, direct St. John's. They weren't going into Chicago. They weren't going anywhere. Uh, finally, you got through to them. OK, well, I guess we're landing. Well, on a regular day, these aircraft are used to just transitioning airspace and, you know, very, very structured setup. Now, they're being forced into a, an airport where they've probably have never been before. The oceanic traffic is typically your big iron, your, your heavy aircraft, uh, you know, over 300,000 pounds with, with hundreds of passengers on board, the wide bodies, your big Boeings, your big Airbuses, and then Gander's not accustomed to seeing that type of traffic and certainly not the volume. American 49, Gander Center, squat code 2401. Go ahead, American 49. The morning of September 11th, we flew from Paris, France, back to Dallas. It was a beautiful day. We even commented when we were over the North Atlantic what a gorgeous day it was. As we're crossing the Atlantic, we have one of our radios on what is called airborne common. So that would be a means by which uh, aircraft can talk to one another to try to get updates on weather, winds, uh, turbulence, uh, what's happening. Say that again, please. Fire at the World Trade Center. It was over the uh, common frequency. And that's, uh, that's the area where we launched the airplane. We heard somebody uh, chirp up that uh, an airplane hit a tower in uh, New York City. Atlantic inbound aircraft, this is US Air 27. We're receiving word from our dispatch that a plane has flown into the World Trade Center in New York City. Oh, OK. Not necessarily alarming or anything at that moment in time. You know, we talked about it, and we thought, you know, it must have been a small airplane. And then about 20 minutes later, something came. <laughs> came across the radio again that another aircraft um, hit uh, a tower, uh, and it was my experience uh, from the military that uh, I can recognize a coordinated attack. Level three, three, zero, the traffic looks like... All of a sudden, we start seeing some of the airplanes turning around, making a 180, which you would never see that, because the North Atlantic tracks are directional. They're one way, and nobody turns around on them. And so my first thought was, hey, Beverly, uh, why don't we consider turning this thing around and taking people back from where they came from? She goes, you know, that's not a bad idea. Uh, why don't you see if you can begin that? As soon as I started to pick up the radio, we hear, we're common. We tried coordinating a return to Europe with Shenwick Control. And they deny clearance. They're not approving any reversals. And I sat up straight in my seat and began to process. 
I'm not really worried about what's behind me like a hijacking type scenario. At that moment, I was truly focused on what my end game was, getting this uh, aircraft and the people on the ground. Lemsip first action helps stop a cold early. This, not so much. <laughs> Bit late for that. This won't help. Direct Gander to send to flight level 290 initially. Expect lower. Continental 23 Heavy, Gander approach. Descend and maintain 6,000. Continental 23 Heavy. Continental 23 Heavy, clear visual approach, runway 21. Contact the tower at 128.6. In 2001, I was uh, working as an air traffic controller at Gander Tower. My job is to get them on the ground safely. I was uh, basically standing here receiving estimates from the guys in the center. Well, we coordinate closely with the towers uh, on arrivals. You descend to 6,000 feet? We bring them in six to eight miles from the uh, from the end of the runway, turn them over to the tower. Continental 23 Heavy, down to tower. Runway 21, clear to land. Continental 23 Heavy. Runway 21, clear to land. Continental 23 Heavy, winds 320 and 3. Plan minimum time on runway and utilize first available taxiway on rollout. Traffic on final. And we had uh, a line of traffic coming in from 10 miles, I could see, 10 to 15 miles, maybe, of traffic. It was a big deal getting, getting those airplanes down without incident. A lot of North American passengers knew there was a crisis. They knew they had to get on the ground. There was no time to mess around and, and explain things. Where are we going to put these aircraft? Where are we going to put these people? But the main goal was to get them out of the sky, onto the surface, and that means using that runway, using those taxiways, any piece of pavement you can to park these airplanes and keep the flow going. You don't want anybody stopping on a runway. You don't want anybody stopping on a taxiway after they turn off, because that's going to clog things up. And, and there's a line coming. They're lined up on final. I was here watching the aircraft uh, land and then issue the taxi instruction as required on where I was going to park them. Normally, air traffic control at an airport of this size does not get involved in parking assignments. But as you can understand, on September 11th, parking assignment became paramount. Normal procedure is the ground crews would have a designated spot when an aircraft come in. That day, because the ground crew didn't know where the aircraft were going, they said, listen, you send the aircraft where you want to send them, and we'll make sure we're there. Air Canada 849, give way to the Delta 767. Speedbird 75. Taxi via Alpha to Apron, two. monitor ground 121.9. I just made the plan as I went. They maintained listing watch on the frequency. And they just uh, went where I was telling the aircraft to go. Once he got on the ground, he started asking questions. Can you tell us what's going on? And my response was, I can't tell you exactly what's going on, but obviously it's a catastrophic event. When we got on the ground, Captain Ballard came over the PA and, and, and announced to us that there had been a terrorist incident in the United States. 
and involved uh, multiple aircraft in the impact of buildings. And it was, it was a shock. I got pretty angry. Then I started to think, you know, what's our status here? Who's on our plane? Could they be suspects? Could they be tied to these other terrorists? I didn't know. Once we heard all of the US airspace was closed, we knew that we had to divert somewhere in Canada. So the most likely cities would be Montreal, Toronto, Edmonton, Calgary. You know, we had enough fuel to go to anywhere in Canada. American 49, I am instructing you to land. Your options are Gander or St. John's. Hey, Beverly, I asked, why don't we continue flying over to Edmonton if we got more than enough fuel to do so? And then once we refuel and they open up airspace again, we can just fly straight south home. Gander Center, American 49 Heavy. And there's any chance that we can continue our flight to Edmonton? I asked if, uh, if we could continue and uh, refile uh, to Edmonton. Normally, when we are going to divert, the captain chooses the divert airport. And that day was quite different. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm afraid you don't understand. American 49, you do not understand me. You have been directed to land. I'll be back in 60 seconds. The decision has not been made. I will make it for you. It was not even up for discussion. It was an order to land in Gander. We normally don't get orders to land somewhere, but that day we did. They had major issues at the tower trying to park those airplanes because everything is happening so fast. And can we squeeze two more in? Can we squeeze another one in? And I'm on the phone to the tower and saying, how many more can we take? How many more can you handle? I don't know. Let me check. Dean, how many more can you take? If we open up a runway, I can take another 15. 15. It was a constant coordination with the tower. You were on a phone to the tower. You were coordinating with the high-level side as you're coming out of high-level airspace. You have a phone in your hand to St. John's Tower. How many more can you take? Take another two or three. It was crazy morning. Yes, you heard correctly. U.S. airspace is closed at this time. Tanza 416, you are directed to land in Gander. No, you're not listening to me. There's a crisis in New York, and U.S. airspace is closed. Runway 21 was the runway that all the aircraft that were diverted in here landed on. Uh, runway 21 runs this direction down here. Everybody landed going this direction, made a right turn on Taxiway Alpha at almost to the end of runway 21, and then back up towards the main apron. Our biggest concern with runway 21 is the fact that at the end of the runway, uh, for the last 1,500 feet, there's no turnoff. You have to do a 180 back taxi to the uh, first turnoff. They need to clear that runway as soon as possible and keep that aircraft moving along the taxiway because here's your buddy coming right down behind you. We're spacing the aircraft to give us sufficient time to get them slowed down and get them off the runway before the next aircraft was final. And in this particular case, I guess somebody was a little bit slower. he was slower to get off the runway. He wasn't going to be off in time for the Sabina to safely land. The Sabina became in too hot, too heavy. Yeah, if you don't get off the runway, he's not going to be able to land. Oh, we're too close. Sabina 539, go around, fly runway heading, climb and maintain 3,000. Sabina 539, and radar identified. There was no particular plan in place. There was no time. You just had too much traffic coming that had to be dealt with. A 
uh, they were just purging them out of high-level airspace to high-level controllers. We're going to be bringing Indiana 747 in at uh, 22. I compared it to a knot that was tightening. They wanted to get them out. The pilots wanted out. There was apprehension in some of their voices. They wanted to get on the ground as quick as they could. They didn't know if there was more terrorist activity going to happen on their airplanes. You stream step attack. I want to eat an egg. The electronics couldn't keep up to the level of traffic that we had. Lufthansa 446, estimating 14. So we were doing a lot of voice coordination. The old school of just verbal estimates on which aircraft was where, who was following who, the cooperation of the tower controller and the controllers in Ganner Center kept everything straight so that we knew which aircraft was which in the sequence they were for the arrivals. This day was intense. And in Gander, Newfoundland. Yeah, this one up north already. Perfect. Perfect. Gander Perfect. ATC instructs you to turn right. Air France 004, I don't have time to chat right now. Go ahead, American 49. When I finally plugged Gander into the computer, I realized that I was going to be 7,000 pounds over my max landing weight. The aircraft that were not destined for Canada, they were going to be overweight for the arrival, and that's not a good situation. You certainly don't want to have an aircraft that's overweight, laying on a runway, and then break the landing gear and become disabled on the runway with all this extra fuel. They had to get down to their landing weight. One way to do that is to dump fuel. This is not something a controller deals with on a regular basis. Harold, got a 777, needs to do a fuel dump. Stand by, we'll get back to you. Typically what happens is the aircraft is put over an isolated area. It needs to be high enough to where the fuel will evaporate before it reaches the ground. And they also need to isolate that aircraft and ensure that no other aircraft are going to be transversing the airspace beneath it with, with at least 2,000 feet. You have to be careful as to how you're maneuvering the airplanes to keep them all clear of each other. Reg. Yeah? Can you set up a flight path for a fuel dump, please? Bet you half these planes are going to need it. Got it. American 49, we're going to set you up with an area near Gander for your fuel dump. Stand by. Copy that, Gander. Our mindset is to gas and go and to get home. Uh, that's the completion of the mission. Uh, but the first step in this mission now has been changed to uh, landing safely and coordinate with the controllers to begin uh, dumping fuel to get down to landing weight. American 49, contact Gander Center on 131.8 to complete your fuel dump. American 49. America 49, Gander Center. For fuel dump, proceed 50 miles due east, descend 18,000, commence dump there. Copy that, Gander Center. Northeast 50 miles, descend 18,000. They started clearing the airspace or making sure that they had a good area to send me to, so they basically just gave me a vector, and uh, that was the heading I stayed on until I jettisoned the 7,000 pounds. Commencing fuel dump now. It's high octane fuel, it's risky business. Explosion, fires, is, and, and then you're into a, a real catastrophic deal if that were to happen. See this? As much as it might shock some people, if you begin to dump fuel the higher altitude you are, it, um, it disperses and atomizes uh, before it actually reaches uh, the ground. Gander Center, American 49 Heavy. Fuel dump complete. Roger, American 49 Heavy. Fly heading 190. Once the aircraft gets down to its landing weight or below, it will be resequenced to the back of the line and have an uh, attempt at an approach. They then vectored me onto a 95 mile final into runway two, one into Gander. Hey, friends, 004, I don't have time to chat right now. Decisions had to be made. There was so much information that you had to take in. It was too much for one person at that point. It's a small town, word gets around. The controllers who were off came in on their own uh, volition. Without being called, they knew we needed people. 
We went from the two or three seed at that time of the day to 14. Good to see you, bye. It's good to see you. They came together as a team, right? No rivalry, no animosity, no argument. Everybody pulls together, helping each other out. You know, if I'm, you know, overcome with airplanes, you can take some off, off of my scope. It was so gratifying and unbelievable that once word spread, we were actually turning down controllers who wanted to come in and work. But uh, you, you can't get too emotional about things. Negative. Negative. Even though you might be hurting, you've got to cope with what's going on. You, you can't just get up and pull your headset out and say, I had enough. It's highly orchestrated ballet that's occurring. We're getting prepared for the approach and landing, and uh, that takes us down uh, to lower altitude. It was interesting that this small base had a line of aircraft on final. It looked like Dallas-Fort Worth on a beautiful summer day at the peak of rush hour. This was not normal, uh, and that we were landing. Under tower, American 49, clear to land. Normally, our final approaches are about 15 miles out, and mine was 95 miles, which made me one of the last airplanes to land. That was number 36 out of 38 wide bodies to touch down that day. Okay, America 49, I'm going to need you to pull a 180 and then we'll back down runway zero. Yeah, we got to get some extra hands on deck here because we only got, well, that's what I can tell you. We filled up the main apron first um, just because at that point we didn't know how many aircraft we were going to have. A bit of a challenge for an aircraft of this size. Well, I don't know what you want me to tell you. And I got nowhere else for you to go. Virgin 21. I can see airplanes everywhere. They are all over the taxiways, they're parked on a runway, they're parked all over the area at the terminal, and I didn't know where I was gonna be able to park. There's an old abandoned runway in the middle of the airport that's left over from the Second World War. We parked some aircraft on that, and then at uh, the last dozen or so aircraft that landed were actually parked on what was one of our active runways, because at that point, we, were, we had nowhere else to put people. There have certainly been that many airplanes at this airport, even more, but not wide bodies. And that's what was so unique about it, is we were all wide bodies. All the big guys. <laughs> My name is Barbara Fast. In 2001, I was the director of intelligence for the U.S. European forces assigned in Stuttgart, Germany. I had a tri-band phone, which in those days allowed you to be able to communicate both to Europe as well as to the United States. It's fast. What's going on? What can you tell me? My office told me that two separate large commercial aircraft had flown into the World Trade Center. Oh my God. Shortly after we landed, I had a passenger come up to the cockpit. Uh, Captain? She was knowledgeable about the events, more so than the average person would have been. Captain Bass appeared to appreciate getting the updates that I was able to provide. And I think in situations like this, you want to know what's happening. We worked very hard to try to get her released from our manifest and then to find transportation back to Germany. She ended up leaving the next day. There was a lot of security issues that had to be considered before anybody was allowed off an airplane. 
We didn't know how long the time was going to be. We didn't know if it was just going to be a logistical challenge at the airport uh, because we had no way of anticipating how long this closure of airspace was going to be, uh, whether the passengers would in fact be disembarking. So when you think of people from all over the world, every walk of life and every language, every race, religion, every medical condition, all the issues that would we would have to address. Right now, you can understand that based on what is happening. So there was a lot of uh, stress and uh, fear, uncertainty. I haven't heard confirmation. But and nobody had been able to disembark. In fact, they weren't going to be able to disembark for quite a few hours because there was a threat of, you know, bombs on these aircraft, terrorists on these aircraft, and so on. Today, yeah. Because they're not going to clear this up, and they're not going to Roger that. That's the last one. After everything was over, just looking at the radar, seeing only two aircraft, two military aircraft, one in the west coast of the United States and one on the east coast. It was airy, actually. It was not an airplane in the sky. You're in a place that's busy all the time, and now there's nothing. Radar screens were blank. The silence was deafening. It was almost impossible to believe. It was very touching to see everybody just sitting back with a good job done. I'll always remember that. Great job, Harold. Great job. Well done. It was quick, a couple of hours of frantic action, and uh, then the airplanes were all on the ground. I've never seen anything like it, never seen anything like it since. There's not a Playing in the sky right now. These air traffic controllers were absolute heroes. They were heroes on this day, doing what they did. Never been done before, never been practiced, was even unheard of. For these controllers, this was their Super Bowl. This was their World Series, their time to shine under the lights, and they definitely pulled it off in miraculous fashion. It was never a thought that went through my mind that we could not accomplish this. I look at it as, you know, a day that we could use as an example of how people could just kind of work together and cooperate to get something done. It was sort of a turning point in life somewhat. For me, it was like before 9-11 and after 9-11. You know, innocent people have been killed. I, I, I don't know sometimes where Mankind can do what they can do. Uh, and then the, the other side of it all is, is the good side. Uh, they can rise to the occasion and, and counteract it, and, and hopefully the good will prevail.